Justice. We all want it, and we all have different opinions on how it's delivered. But what about the defendants? Who are the men and women who defend them in court? Why do they do it, and how do they do it? Why do they believe it is so important to our justice system? Attorney Gavin Hollihan, a criminal defense attorney, joins us next to discuss those questions and more. Well, that's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm your host, Sam Chen. Justice, we all have our opinions about it and how it's delivered. But in every case, there's not just the plaintiff or prosecutor, there's also the defendant. And who are the men and women who defend them? Why do they do it? And why do they believe that their job is so essential to the justice system? I'm pleased tonight to be joined by criminal defense attorney Gavin Hollihan as we break down these essential questions. Gavin, thank you for being here. Welcome to the show. Thank it's you good very to have much. You here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, my, our pleasure. Thank you for coming. And before we even get started, can you give us a little bit of your background as an attorney? Uh, what I have found fascinating is that you have actually been on both sides of the table in the courtroom. And so can you just give us a little bit of your background um, as an attorney and, and how you've come to where you are today? Well, when I started as an attorney, I was an assistant district attorney in Lehigh County in the prosecutor's office under... Uh, then Bob Steinberg, who's now a judge, and I started with uh, smaller cases, and in the five years I spent in that office, prosecuted just about everything to come through from DUI cases and summary trials all the way up to homicide and mm -hmm. capital homicide trials. But after five years there, I left and spent two years in civil practice and then switched to criminal defense in private practice. And since uh, then, I've been working a part-time with a firm and now for the last 10, 15 years by myself in a solo practice doing primarily criminal defense. When you look at your career as a criminal defense attorney and also as a prosecutor, what are the, and you mentioned some of the crimes that you prosecuted as a prosecutor, um, what are the, some of these crimes and alleged crimes that you see come across? When we, we think, we, we generally, we watch the news and we see the big ones, right? So we see the Bill Cosby trial, mm -hmm. we see the Ed Pulaski trial here in Allentown, we see the big ones of government corruption or 70 some counts of whatever, the Jerry Sandusky trial. But there's a lot of cases that go on every day that people don't know about, don't hear about. What are some of these crimes or alleged crimes that you're seeing, that you defend, obviously not don't say anything that would cross over that line of client attorney privilege, but what are some of the, the big crimes that you're seeing and, and you're working on? Uh, the volume in the criminal system is still largely drugs, mm -hmm. drug related, so that will be drug trafficking offenses, yeah. being in possession of drugs, but also the things that support a drug habit, so oh. theft, okay. um, scams, things like that. Prostitution is closely tied to the mm -hmm. drug trade, so much of what we see in terms of volume is somehow either directly or indirectly related to controlled substance, drug abuse, drug addiction. And then on top of that, we have violence, which mm. does sometimes go hand in hand with that. Sure. Um, domestic violence fills up a, a large part of one of our courtrooms. It deals, we have one judge who's designed to deal with the domestic violence. Okay. So, uh, but the day-to-day -day crime generally fits into the category of drugs, um, violence, theft, um, without getting much attention on a day-to-day -day basis sure. from the newspapers. Let me ask you, we'll get into the ethics of it, but let me just ask you logistically first. When you sit down, I mean, a, a prosecutor, we we, some, we have some knowledge of how that operates, If even just from watching Law & Order, where it's something, a lot of times it gets referred to by the police department or so forth. When someone comes to you, calls you, how does that logistically, how does that process of, that, of defense begin? Uh, you're obviously, you know you're on the other side of the table from, from the prosecutor this time. Um, I mean, are there, for you, are there questions of the person's guilt or innocence? Is that something you discuss? What's that process look like? Uh, that, the process itself varies from client to client sure. and case to case. So 
over the time, I've developed a, a way of dealing with clients that really lets the client guide the first interaction. Mm -hmm. Some clients will come in and say, this is what I did and this is what I got charged with. Uh, oh, wow. Other clients will come in and with, without even a clear understanding of what the police allege they have done. Oh, okay. Most of the clients come to us after they've been charged with a crime. Okay. So we have a, a clear identified offense, mm -hmm. clearly identified conduct, and then we start from there. We do sometimes have people come in who are under investigation who have not yet been charged. Sure. Or allegations have been made against them with no criminal charges. But the clients are very different. Like I said some clients, even in the face of video evidence, uh, will deny that they've done anything wrong. Uh, other people will confess to things that the police don't even know about yet. Oh my goodness. Um, but it, it primarily starts with the fundamental concept of confidentiality. That sure. Anyone who consults with me or any other criminal defense attorney, mm -hmm. what we talk about is confidential, mm -hmm. even if they never hire me to do the job. Uh, okay. So they may hire a different lawyer. Uh, they may never get charged with that crime, so they don't need a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But the things that they tell me remain confidential. confidential. Um, Forever, quite frankly. So if they call you, they have that meeting with you, let's say it's one of those guys that comes in, confesses everything, you're looking at what he's been charged with, and you're like, you shouldn't have said these first four, then no one's, no one's charging you with that. And then he goes with a different attorney. Prosecution can't call you in as a witness. That's and correct. And say what, what, I mean, you're protected by attorney-client privilege then. That's absolutely correct. Okay, correct. So, so, so there's a, essentially a safe zone for them to discuss somewhat freely the, the case with the attorney. Right. Generally speaking, the way I explain it to clients is if you've consulted with me mm -hmm. because I'm an attorney, mm -hmm. whatever we talk about is confidential. Mm -hmm. Now, that does require that it be done in a confidential manner. So sure. if there are other people standing around while a potential client confesses to his crimes, there's no confidentiality with third parties. Okay. So sometimes we'll have a a client whose spouse wants to sit in on our interview oh, okay. or who, a, a child or a young mm -hmm. person who brings a parent to our interview, mm -hmm. there's no confidentiality in some of those situations. Okay. So we'll ask that third party to step out. So but. strictly between you as the attorney and them as the client. Exactly. That makes sense. One of the, the I think one of the perceptions in public, and, and maybe it's from the, the endless number of courtroom dramas and TV shows, but the perception is that the defense is always wrong. And this has been challenged a little bit with, uh, I don't know how much TV you watch, but CBS's new drama, Bull, where he is particularly works with def defendants. But generally you watch Law and & Order and things like this, and, and there's this perception in the public that defendant is always wrong, not just wrong, but that they're vile, terrible human beings. But we also know that oftentimes defendants not only or do they get a not guilty verdict? Oftentimes defendants are actually not guilty. What is the percentage of that from what you see of defendants who are actually just falsely accused or wrongly accused or they're being charged with a crime that, or, or a punishment that doesn't fit the crime and so forth? I have somewhat of an uh, unorthodox view on that. I, many of the people who are charged, mm -hmm. many of the people who are arrested are in fact guilty. Okay. Um, and I don't see that as a bad thing. I, sure. I think the alternative would be worse. If the police were arresting and our DA's office were prosecuting a lot of innocent people, sure. that would be a problem. Um, but especially here locally, the number, I don't know what the percentage is, but many of the people who come to me are guilty. They may mm -hmm. be guilty of something other than what they've been charged with okay, or something fair. less serious. Sure. So we often see cases that I would construe as overcharging okay. um, where they increase the charge against a person based on the conduct. Mm -hmm. That happens frequently. But there are people who come in who are genuinely innocent. They've been misidentified, sure. which is a big issue. Uh, most people who aren't involved in the criminal justice system think an eyewitness identification is rock solid. Um, those of us in the system know that's not true at all. Sure. Um, many, many of the exonerations that we've seen over the past several years were cases that were convictions based on eyewitness identification. And the more we learn about the science of eyewitness identification, mm -hmm. the weaker those cases look. Um, but there are also people who have been lied about mm -hmm. um, for some kind of purpose. We see that sometimes with um, domestic partners. One will uh, lie about another, be it just out of spite or sure. vengeance or to gain leverage in a divorce or a child custody situation. Um, but 
overall, I think it's fair to say that most of the people, large majority of the people who are arrested and charged, are in fact guilty or responsible for some criminal conduct. And it's an interesting point you make, and, and I have to agree with that too, which you know, it's probably a good thing that the DA's office isn't it doesn't have a large number of, of miss, uh, wrong charges that are just flying out of there right. against innocent people. Right. Let me, and not that uh, this is not directed at any viewer, of course, in particular, but we may have viewers who watch and say, I may need a criminal defense attorney. <laughs> you never know in this business, right. right? Where do they start? You mentioned they come to you at all different stages in this process. Where did what should they do? Do you wait till you're charged? Do you wait? Do you call someone if you think something a certain incident may eventually come come down the pipeline? What should someone do if they're if they have a concern like this? At what point do they call you, or should they call you? Yeah, when when they should call is as early as possible. Okay. Um, good criminal defense attorneys will give advice uh, up front before. So I'll get questions uh, from people who say the police want to interview me and should I go talk to them? And mm -hmm. the answer might be yes, you should talk to them. It might be no, you shouldn't talk mm -hmm. to them. But it's almost always you should go with an attorney. Okay. Uh, and not the attorney who did your real estate closing and not the <laughs> attorney who wrote your will. Someone who understands law Fair enforcement, enough. who understands the police, understands the criminal system. Um, but the earlier, earlier you can get a lawyer involved, the better for you. That makes sense. Um, Gavin, thank you for the information. Um, when we come back, I really want to dive into some of the ethics of the, the art of criminal defense. And so don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Gavin, thank you again for, for being here, for taking your time to, to just really break down these questions that I think a lot of people have. What, you wrote an article recently for Network Magazine about how can you defend these people, specifically not talking about defendants, but what the society would call the worst of the worst, and, and criminals, hardened criminals, and so forth. Uh, we know the right to an attorney is guaranteed by law in the Miranda rights. And if someone can't afford one, this is something that our country believes in so strongly that they will be appointed an attorney, a public defender. That is different than what you do, which is you, you've chosen this profession to defend them. Tell us why and why that is so important to you. Well, I, I see the role of criminal defense attorney, um, both privately and a public defender, mm -hmm. Uh, is really a, uh, the implementation of the constitutional rights that a, that a person has in mm -hmm. society. And if a person has a right to be innocent until proven guilty, and if the government is required to prove their guilt, then without someone who's trained and willing to do that, yeah. it's a right that, that has no value. Um, mm -hmm. And the right pertains to everybody in our country. So if the defense attorneys, people in my position refuse to represent a person, either because of their race or their ethnicity mm -hmm. or even if the nature of the offense that they've been charged with, well, that person is essentially denied the constitutional right to be presumed innocent, the constitutional right to an attorney, the mm -hmm. right to have a jury trial, simply by either the charge the government has filed against that person or their race, national mm -hmm. origin, religion. So. My position is from the criminal defense perspective, if we fail to represent anybody, yeah. even the worst people, the worst accusations, well then we're denying that role that we have as part of our constitution and our foundation. And you're really turning over to the government the right to dictate who can get a defense and who can't based on factors that are that are that are impermissible. Yeah. So the, to you, this is a much larger picture than the defendant than the client in your office, and even than the charges that are brought against them? To me, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's a question of the integrity of the entire judicial system. Mm -hmm. if, if people charged with a certain offense, pick a heinous offense such as you know, child pornography mm -hmm. or murder, um, if they cannot obtain an appropriate defense, meaning um, an experienced, talented, skillful criminal defense attorney, and those people exist in private practice and in our public defender's office yeah. without question. But if they're denied that because of the nature of the charges, then the government, it won't be long till it figures out that we can charge this person hmm. with one of those crimes and we know yeah. that they'll not be provided an adequate defense. defense sure. Michael Walzer, who's a political theorist, has a, a theory he calls thick and thin. And he talks about content and structure in government. And one is thick, the other has to be thin. And he actually makes the argument that 
that uh, a constitutional government like the United States and judicial, the judicial system needs to be thick on structure and thin on content for exactly the same reasons that you brought up. I, w I want to just play devil's advocate for a moment. Someone's sure. going to come back at that and say, but aren't you, I mean, if you're a good defense attorney and you're giving it your best and you get someone off that you know is guilty, aren't you allowing that crime to just continue? How do you respond to that, that someone says there's a moral obligation to put these people away? Yeah, there's two answers to that. One is there is no moral obligation for me mm -hmm. as a criminal defense attorney to put people in jail. Correct. Or to um, make half measures sure. in defending someone. I'm not permitted to make up my mind whether this person deserves a trial mm -hmm. or not. That's a decision the client makes. So that's the specific answer. The bigger picture in the system mm -hmm. is that we have a system that's designed to figure out who's guilty and who's not guilty. And it, it's not designed to figure out who did it or who didn't do it. There, hmm. it. It is built around the premise that the government making an allegation against the citizen is required to prove that allegation beyond a reasonable doubt. If they can't prove that, then that person is not guilty. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it as a question of innocent or not innocent. It's a mm -hmm. question of has the government satisfied their obligation to prove that this person is guilty? And my obligation is to force them to do that. Mm -hmm. And if they can't do that, then they lose and the client goes free. And that's not a moral failing of sure. me. And it's not a moral failing of anything. That's actually how our system is designed to be. Right. So the, the trial itself then, and I think this is, there's a lot of confusion over what the purpose of the courts are. I, the trial itself isn't making any moral judgment or moral passing on any, on the prosecution, the defense, on anyone in that room. It is really assessing whether or not there is, the, the, if the government's making the case that the government's presentation of evidence and facts is in fact conclusive enough to ascertain this person did or, or did not commit whatever they're being charged with. So there's really no moral judgment being passed by a juror, or there shouldn't be, is that? Is that the idea? The idea is that there should not be, mm -hmm. that, that the moral concept of whether this person is right or wrong, a good person or a bad person, um, is a decision that's independent of whether the government has enough evidence to say that this crime occurred and that this is the person mm -hmm. who committed that crime and to convince the jury of that beyond a reasonable mm -hmm. doubt. Invariably, the moral component comes into it, especially, sure. and juries we know make decisions based on their moral perceptions. But you know, I hate to use the phrase situational morality, but sure. you know, people's morals are not the same across the board, Correct. depending on their background, their circumstances. So Correct. if we allow the moral component of a case to decide whether someone is factually guilty or not, then the system has broken down. So the, the question of why would someone, a murderer, for example, or an alleged murderer, let's say, def deserve such a robust defense, you're saying that it is less about that person and it is more about this entire system and that if we don't provide defense for that, for who, who we would call the worst of the worst, if we don't provide defense for them, we are really tearing down the system. Absolutely correct, sure. If, if you can avoid providing a defense to somebody or an adequate defense to a person simply by picking a charge that is most egregious sure. or most heinous, sure, mm -hmm. then in my experience it wouldn't take long for the government to figure yeah. that out and to target people with those types of charges knowing that they'll be deprived an adequate defense. Are there defense attorneys who don't, who, who will draw lines and say I'll defend these and not those and, and what do you say to them? Uh, I, I think it's unfortunate that the answer to your question is yes, yes, there are people who do that. And that's one of the interesting differences between private defense attorneys mm -hmm. and public defenders. Mm -hmm. Public defenders, um, like I said, in this area are very good and they don't get to make those choices. So they willingly, when they become a public defender, mm -hmm. they know they're going to defend the worst of the worst. Sure. They know they may be tasked with defending somebody who has committed a crime that they find morally reprehensible. Mm -hmm. On the other side, private criminal attorneys are free to choose. Mm -hmm. They can pick uh, this crime I'm not going to represent a person on simply because of the crime. Mm -hmm. And I, there are many people in our community who do that uh, for whatever reason, whether it's moral or ethical or they just can't stomach the thought of that. I find that view distasteful. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand it, sure. but in my view of this system as a, as a whole, it requires, if you're going to be a criminal defense attorney, that you don't shy away from certain cases, mm -hmm. that you don't deprive certain people 
of a defense because of your uh, squeamishness or your uh, ethical issues with the crime charge or even the person charged. Mm -hmm. So my, my attitude for those lawyers is um, you can send me those cases. If, you, <laughs> if you'd like me to do them, I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think they, they um, short circuit somewhat of the system um, by, by picking and choosing mm -hmm. based on those grounds. Yeah, I think when you see it in the large picture that you're describing, that this is more than one person and one charge, that makes a lot of sense. Would you say the same on the flip side then to, to the prosecution that you, as a criminal defense attorney, your hope is that the prosecution is good, is strong, comes with their best case, that this is a situation where it, it's not, of course, every attorney wants to win, but it's not so much about what, who gets the win at the end, in their column at the end of the day, but for the justice system to work, you want your prosecutor to be at the top of their game. Sure, yeah, mm -hmm. if the prosecutor's office is not doing their job well, mm -hmm. two things can happen. Uh, one, people who should be convicted are not convicted. Mm -hmm. Now, on a case-by-case -case basis, that's good for me and, sure. and my criminal defense crowd, but in a systemic basis, that's poor because sure. the other thing that happens is people who should not be prosecuted and convicted get prosecuted and mm -hmm. convicted. So for the system to work accurately, you need all three sides to be firing on all cylinders, the defense, the prosecution, and the courts. And the courts. There's a lot of talk in society about, and this revolves around a lot of different sub-issues, race issues, education issues, demographics, um, economic stability issues, but there's a lot of talk that the judicial system fails a lot of people. You've been in it for decades. Your take on the judicial system, is it successful? Has it been successful? Um, are there improvements to be made to it? How do you see that, especially as you're talking about this as an entire system that we're defending? Uh, in a, on a systemic level, our, our, my experience with the judges is, and the judiciary is they try very hard to get it right, especially mm -hmm. on the local level where they're interacting with people on mm -hmm. a daily basis. System-wide, there, there is room for significant improvement, mm -hmm. particularly in areas of race, in the areas of addressing and dealing with mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's hard to say that the judicial system needs a lot of help when I have to appear in front of the judges every, <laughs> That's every fair. day. That's fair. Uh, but it's true, it does. Sure. It, needs, it needs work. Sure. Um, well, that, I appreciate you breaking that down for us. I appreciate you, especially the insight that this is more than just your defendant, more your client, more than just a, a charge on the sheet of paper, that we are looking at an entire system. And we need to be, be aware of that when we look at that. So Gavin, thank you for joining us. And uh, don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Gavin, thank you again for your time today and just really breaking down something that I think is on a lot of people's minds, even if it's unspoken. One of the fascinating things, and what we like always use this last segment for is to get to know our guests. And one of the fascinating things that you and I talked about off camera was that you did this panel, this, this, this talk uh, about what, how one would go about defending John Wilkes Booth, who was you know, assassinated President Lincoln in the 1800s. How did you get into that, and, and what did you have to say? Uh, the idea of how you would defend John Wilkes Booth, I, part of it goes to the whole theory of being a criminal defense attorney, and can mm -hmm. you defend the, the, the indefensible or mm -hmm. the worst among us? But um, it started with a program at the Bar Association of Lehigh County for a program we were doing in Gettysburg, and with the help of the director of the Lehigh Valley Historical Society, we were able to put together uh, experts on the assassination um, of, of Abraham Lincoln and also John Wilkes Booth being sought, chased down. And, right. But there were trials arising out of that based mm -hmm. on his co-conspirators. And there's a lot of odd things that went on. There were mostly military tribunals, but there's certainly room to argue whether those were tried appropriately uh, and what happened with them. And, we learned, I, I learned some interesting historical things that led to some questions about how that, that whole thing unfolded and what would have actually happened had John Wilkes Booth not been killed but would have been brought to trial. What do you think would have been the result of that trial? Well, it's interesting. There, there was those, The ones who were captured as part of the conspiracy mm -hmm. were tried before a military tribunal. Mm -hmm. They were sure. all convicted. Um, some were executed right away. Some were sentenced to time um, mm -hmm. uh, at hard labor. Before those cases could get to the United States Supreme Court, the survivors were all pardoned. 
Oh, okay. So there never was a, a Supreme Court decision on the appropriateness of the trial mm -hmm. of John Wilkes Booth's co-conspirators. That's interesting. And there's also another co-conspirator who had escaped, was not caught at the time, actually mm -hmm. fled to Canada, fled to Europe, was eventually arrested in Europe and brought back. Oh, wow. By that time, the Civil War had ended. The military tribunals were over. He was tried as a co-conspirator in the assassination at a, at a regular jury trial of okay. civilians, not of military, and he was not convicted. The jury didn't reach a verdict. They had what we call a hung a hung jury. jury. They didn't find that he's guilty. They didn't find he's not guilty. And the government never tried to retry him. Oh, that's interesting. So he was never convicted in a, what we would call a civil jury trial in, in, uh, for the criminal acts um, and never retried, never convicted. So there's, there's more than meets the eye in the defense oh, of John Wilkes Booth. I, I remember hearing when I was young, actually, that uh, President John Adams was a defense attorney and actually took the case of the British soldiers yes. during the ba Boston Massacre. And so that's, uh, that's fascinating to look back in history and, and wonder what that would look like. Yeah, it's part of the whole system that we, that we have operating in this country and it works successfully when everyone does their part. Yeah, Gavin, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It. That is all the time we have tonight, but uh, continue this conversation with us online. Just remember to use the hashtag face the issues. And join us again next week as we unpack another issue. My name is Sam Chan on behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues. Thank you and good night.